Okay, welcome back. This, the group is getting smaller and smaller. This is great because today is the real challenge. Today is the real challenge to our attention uh, today. Challenging to pay attention today. <laughs> We're going to talk about some stuff that you've never seen before. And I'm doing it because I think there's some value in it. I'm doing it because I think there's some value in it. And I'd like you to pay attention. Um, and I, it may require you to spend a few hours, maybe a couple hours, looking at a piece of paper that has some some trigonometric identities on it. But it's a, the idea is to make you understand, if you allow me to assume a stationary environment, I can represent the data that, that, that are generated by that environment in two different ways. You know, one is the so-called time domain representation, and the other is the frequency domain representation. And why should I care about the frequency domain? Yeah, anybody. Again, why are we doing this? Why am I, <laughs> why would I care about the frequency domain? Hi, welcome. What? No, it's, it's more obvious than that. I mean, macro, we, we, do, we decompose macro into two components last, at the very beginning of the lecture, the, the course, yeah. Cycles, right, right. So we have trend, and then we have the movements around the trend. It's a somewhat arbitrary decomposition, but it, we think it's important because the, the cycle seems to be generated by facts that don't correlate so well with the, the long run, right? So that's why we have growth and cycles. And cycles, to study cycles, you need to think about frequencies, and the Fourier transform is a way of decomposing um, something into frequencies. And engineers use this every day. It's used every time you look at a YouTube video, it uses what's called a fast Fourier transform. And it transforms data that's in, that's in Cartesian form into a frequency form, and then it reverses it back. It makes it very easy to filter out stuff and resend it. So the image you see on a YouTube video is, is really just a, is a, is a compressed or reduced form version of what you actually was made in, in the first, in, in, the, in the analog version or the, the, the way it was filmed. So this is kind of an interesting fact that transfers, and Sargent and some of his colleagues in the, in the, about 30 years ago trans, transformed macro by making us think about this. Because we, we care about cycles, we care about the frequencies that we call the business cycle. We don't care about the inventory cycle so much, and we certainly don't care about the Christmas cycle. Mm -hmm. And there is a Christmas cycle in the data. There's a Christmas cycle in the demand for money. There's a Christmas cycle in the holdings of cash. So one thing is to, if, we, if, you, let me, if you allow me to, to assume stationarity in the environment for our, our idealized um, hypothetical models, I can actually go back and forth between a time series realization of the data and a transform of that, of that model into something that shows the concentration of variance that's explained by different frequencies. Right, that's going to be the, the end of today's lecture, but I'm going to lead into it by motivating, repeating what we did last time. So last time we, we really focused on the, the state space as a very convenient and very flexible and not necessarily unique representation of a model, be it a time series model or, in fact, as we'll see later in the course, any model you choose to write down that has stationarity Markov properties. Okay. And today I'm going to push that a little bit harder and explain why macroeconomists are interested in things that are called uh, uh, the impulse response function. So we have, a, we have a model and we tweak it, we shock it one time, what happens to all the variables? This never happens in reality. In reality we have a shock every day, many shocks, possibly shocks we can't identify. But in, in a case of the model that we've written down, we can, we can make that... Uh, that mental assumption that only the shock occurred today, you know, the Chairman Powell woke up and just got really mad and raised interest rates. What would happen to the U.S. economy? What would happen if Lagarde decided to raise interest rates? So that, that's kind of a, it's a rarefied sort of um, mental experiment. It's not just mental, it's the model, it's model driven. It's very, very clear we can make statements about it. And in reality, we can hit the model with a, with a sequence of, 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 of shocks over time and see how the moments of the model look. We can simulate the model. It's called a simulation. And we can also look at 
We can compare variances. There's lots of other stuff we can do. And that's what macroeconomists do. Ultimately, we have another way of looking at the model, which is to just ignore all those shocks and say, okay, how does this model, remember the model's like a meat grinder. It takes the shocks and it, it cranks out this data. Right? That was the, that was the, the Slutsky idealization of, of macro or of, of economics. So you could imagine, uh, uh, maybe there's another way of thinking about this. If we know that the underlying s shocks are, have a certain sort of vanilla flavor, the transform of the shocks gives us information. And that transform of the shocks can be represented in another way. Rather than using impulse response functions, you can use what's called the frequency domain representation or the spectral representation. And that involves transforming this set of moving averages that we use to hit this vanilla shock and represent it in a different way. Represent it on the interval zero to pi. Okay, and that's the strength of the shock transform into cycles at different frequencies. So you don't have to know the individual shocks anymore. You just have to know how the model transforms a long, long series of shocks into cycles. And the peak of the spectrum will tell you where the most variance is occurring in your model. Okay, so this is, uh, this is what engineers have known since, since Fourier <laughs> or since Gauss. Gauss also thought about this. So a lot of really smart people have thought about this. But uh, economists sort of discovered it about 50 years ago. Some smart economists discovered it even before that in the time series world, but that's not really economics. But now we're, so I dedicate one lecture to this because I think it's important, and there's a, there are a couple of really important papers out there. One is, which is Mark Watson, who actually, in the Journal of Political Economy in the 1990s said, we really need to ask our models to do more than just do an impulse response. We need to look at the covariance at different frequencies. If we really care about business cycles, we, we don't want a model that just generates a nice looking impulse response but has vir you know, virtually no power to explain the business cycle frequency. And what is that? What is the business cycle frequency? I mean, who wants to take a guess? You know, just look back into your, you're all young people, you haven't seen many business cycles, but you've seen a few, right? When was the last really big recession we had? Just a few months ago, right? We had the COVID recession. And then before that, I don't know. <laughs> you weren't born yet. <laughs> when was the last recession before COVID? The great financial crisis, maybe? OK, maybe there, was one maybe there was one before that. I wasn't paying attention. But you know, again, we have to define all that. But that's what business cycle analysis is about. Because we know when those things happen, lots of other things move together, and that's what covariance is. And then we want the covariance to look like the real, the real world. So normally, a business cycle in the OECD countries has a, has a well, you can define frequency, or you can define uh, uh, the periodicity of a series. And these are averages, because the, the actual data does not look like a sine wave. Right? It looks like a mixture of sine waves, and that's what Fourier tried to tell us. So the, the strongest sine wave seems to be moving around a periodicity of two to five years. But then again, you have a Japanese cycle recently that was like 10 plus years. So there's no absolute perfect answer to this. This is an average number. So the average model we generate should generate average cycles that look kind of like the data. That's kind of the, that's the I would call it the Watson critique. Okay, that's what I'm gonna to try to motivate today using what we've already learned, and I'll review today and uh, next week, uh, the so-called time domain representation. That's where we usually live. But if you want to make a real impression with your model, if you do macro, you wanna think about this. And if you, want, if, you, if you do other stuff, I mean, frequency domain comes in a lot of, lot of places that people don't expect. Okay, but I, just, I, it's, I feel like it's my duty to, to put this out for one, one hour and let you look at it. Because you can, under very loose assumptions about the environment, as long as it's stationary, you can go back and forth and it's a unique transform. So you write down the time uh, domain representation, I can put it in my machine and generate a frequency domain representation. And if you tell me what the frequency domain representation is, I can, in principle, go back to the transform of white noise that would give me a cycle like that, and it's also unique. 
Okay, that's also kind of a fun mathematical fact. You can use a computer to do it as precisely as you like. The problem is we don't have much data since economies exist. So if you, if you, if you, you, know, you have to ask the historians to generate a few quarterly series for us, uh, but that doesn't stop us from thinking about it. Nor does it help stop us from comparing, um, constructing large panels of data, because we have lots of current countries since 1945 that have quarterly data. We can, we can make some uh, hand-waving arguments that these, these uh, implicit spectra or the spectra that are uh, actually in the data um, look like a model that we play with. Okay, so that's just a very lengthy introduction of what I'm going to do today. Last week, we finished up the discrete uh, state Markov chain. We made this amazing jump into what's called a, a continuous state but still discrete time Markov process, the motivation for macroeconomics. And then we introduced this linear system, the linear process defined on a random vector that has the Markov property. And we call that the, that's, that we call that the state space. It's kind of like a machine, you know? You just have to make a few minimal assumptions, get the notation right, and then we can generate all sorts of interesting objects that are good for us when we start looking at data, uh, we start making forecasts, when we start simulating the model. And today we'll compute the spectrum using the same thing. So this is all from chapter two and three of Lundqvist and Sargent. It was no, this is, we're going very slowly. Next week we do a real model. Okay, we'll do a model that, that is familiar and should be like part of your toolkit always in macro, which is the permanent income life uh, cycle uh, consumption hypothesis model. Okay, and we can use all the tools we've learned to date to, to, to study the properties of that. Okay, so I wanna make a couple of administrative ex uh, announcements. There's problem set one, it's now on, on Moodle. It's kind of a, to your last chance at reinforcing your knowledge how to do this because this is, is important. Um, and I told you already the correlation with the final, my, my final is high. And there will be a midterm and it's gonna take place on Friday. And it's gonna take place right here, okay? So show up on, <laughs> on Friday, December 9th, and I will give you a midterm. And then you have to ever talk to me again if you don't like, if you do, you can, <laughs> uh, if you want to. But um, you know, we have, Lutz and I have organized this sort of geordnete uh, Scheidung. <laughs> so we actually, ha he's gonna have his final on it. And I think this is better because we feel like the micro people have, have taken a bit too much of the stage, you know, with their, it's, in, in macro we call it crowding out. <laughs> product proliferation. Uh, when every, every professor has his own little mini midterm, it kind of squeezes out macro. We don't like that. You know, we're, we're, we're fighting back. Okay? So please write that down. Don't forget, and don't say I didn't tell you. And I will tell you again in Moodle and everything else, but it really is important that you do this. So let's talk about stochastic linear difference, difference equations one more time. Right, we, it's a class of Markov processes with continuous states. It has a, a set of properties that are listed in the last lecture and in Lundqvist and Sargent. It has a, a well-defined initial unconditional expectation of the process. So you have a starting mean, if you like, and you have a starting covariance matrix. Remember, this is a vector. So it could, so like it could be output, inflation, unemployment, it could be uh, industrial production, vacancies on uh, any sort of like vector you choose that, that your model is generating. Then you have a covariance matrix, which is the expectation of the outer product, um, and it's an unconditional expectation. So it's like your starting condition. And then after that, we hit the, the ball gets rolling, the machine gets moving, and every conditional mean there, uh, thereafter is, is basically formed by a simple transform of the state ve vector. It's a linear pre-multiplication of the state vector in period t gives you the expected value uh, conditional xt in the next period. So that's the Markov property. The state is the vector, and therefore it's a linear function of only the state in the previous period. And I would like to pr convince you in the, uh, in the recitation that xt can contain many lags, so it doesn't have to be just this period's values could be last period's values. As long as 
those things can be listed finitely in the state vector. We can, we can, go, we can move from there. So it's a very general setup. And then we have a transition equation which describes how the thing moves through time and it's moved not just by the conditional mean but it's shocked every period with this, with this set of random uh, numbers, this vector of random numbers which doesn't have necessarily the dimensionality of the state vector. It could be larger or smaller. So it's very flexible. It could be one, one by one. It could be um, a jillion of these things as long as it's finite and then it gets sort of mashed into the uh, smaller in that case n less than m. Uh, so this is extremely general. I think Lundqvist and Car Sargent make that uh, quite clear in the book. Um, that's just the beginning. That's the transition equation. And then we call the xt the state vector. So that's the terminology we're going to be using. And um, sometimes it's unfortunate because when you'll go on to Lutz, Lutz will probably look at lagged values as being the state vector. That's OK. But um, if you have endogenous variables that are current, uh, you have to deal with them somehow. So you can either call them policy variables or endogenous variables. Again, using Lundqvist and Sargent, I'm just going to put them all in this, this state vector. It's just a summary of the state of the system, including potentially endogenous variables. I don't make a, a stand on whether the elements of x are endogenous or exogenous. One could be a linear combination of another one, right? They don't have to all be independent. But when you, when you move to actually playing with the models, you'll, you'll make a, a more specified uh, definition of the state vector, if you like, and it doesn't change much. It doesn't change anything at all. But just to keep, you don't have to have uh, purely predetermined variables in the state vector using this notation. Okay? We have an initial condition, so you have to start somewhere, and then you have this transition matrix, and the transmission matrix would be the, all the stuff that would con com convert the shocks today into the state vector today. So all the things that are simultaneous could be summarized by C. You know, simultaneous feedbacks. So there's an identification problem, as you can probably imagine, right? So the definition of omega, we're kind of free to define it any way we want. Um, and then C could take some form and give me the same effect on, on xt plus 1. So we have to make a kind of a, an identifying assumption. We'll restrict omega to have the properties that the Expected value is zero, obviously, and the covariance matrix is, is the identity matrix. So then all the action gets pushed into C. C becomes all the interesting endogenous action, right? So if you have feedbacks, you have multi simultaneous multiplier effects in, in macro models, they all get dumped into C. That's a normalization. It's important, especially if you want to use time series analysis to estimate models or figure out what your model is doing and why when you hit it, hit it with a shock, um, many variables in the, in the current period will, will go into motion. That's because of C not being the identity matrix. Okay, so it's a very general setup. I'm sure you all understand this, so I'm not gonna spend much more time. These fundamental shocks can be, is our free hand, we have a free hand to, to ask how theory might inform the behavior of the shock. So we can look at a monetary model. It could be monetary policy shocks. They could be technological shocks, shocks to technology. They could be shocks to the financial system, um, the valuation of the capital stock. It could be animal spirits, things that are unpredictable in time t minus 1 for t or for t plus 1 per period t. Um, and that Unexpectedness can be defined in many different ways. I mentioned those last time, they'll show up in again. But then again, we may not be able to observe all the state, the state elements, the elements of the state vector. So, and that's what makes this really so interesting. So XT could contain the expectations by, of agents of inflation that I can't observe. As long as I have a theory for it, I can put it in the state vector and track it as it moves through time, even though I can't ever observe it. I can observe behavior conditional on the expectation of inflation, right? So I could look at the, the nominal interest rate as a function of the expected uh, inflation rate. I could have a theory that generates that. So the, this transform of what we have as a state, which is theoretically um, clear in our minds, and what we can actually see in the data is the so-called observer equation. And that's this equation. So any state-based representation consists of two things, the transition equation, and the observer equation, or the observation equation, some people call it that instead. And we can even add a couple of shocks there if we want, but we're not going to do that yet. 
The state, re state representation is not unique, so there's no absolutely correct answer. You can blow up this state vector any way you want and get all sorts of uh, identical implications. Uh, we, we try to make it as simple as possible. That's kind of a goal. So a lot of times, I'll, last year I had a problem that was rather difficult. It turned out that there were many different ways to do it. And then we had to debate whether one way was better or the other than the other. It doesn't really matter as long as you can show that what you've written down is a, a representation of what the model is supposed to be. Okay, so alternative assumptions on the shocks are kind of uh, interesting for, for various reasons. One is that you can make a very strong assumption that everything's normal. Um, and normal means the first two moments matter and that everything else is kind of su superfluous or information. And then we can use that assumption maybe to estimate the model using maximum likelihood. Um, other assumptions are weaker. So A2 is like saying that the conditional expectation given information that's accumulated and not thrown away until period T uh, implies that the expected value is zero and the expected value of the outer product is equal to a constant identity matrix. Okay, and then there's another variant, which is um, less restrictive, which just says it's, it's a restriction on the unconditional expectation, uh, which would say that basically the outer product has an unconditional expectation of I, the identity matrix. Remember, omega is um, m by 1. And the expected value, of course, is 0. And that lagged covariances have 0 expectation. So that's not quite white noise because that would impose constant variance, but we can actually, here we have constant variance, but um, we don't impose any sort of normality uh, assumptions on it. So it's, it's uh, maybe you could call it weak white noise or um, uncorrelated um, martingale differences is one, what some people call it. All right, so we had some definitions of stationarity that I'd just like to repeat because they're important for the, for the following analysis. Um, we talk about covariant stationarity if uh, when the process gets rolling, um, there's an there's a expectation is constant. So I have a, <laughs> have a duplication here, which I just noticed. The expectation of the, um, the, the period t uh, vector and when, when uh, t equals zero is the same. So even at the beginning of time, um, we have an identical, this is, a, this is assuming that even in the initial condition, the expected value has the same, um, exp is the same. And then as we move through time, the, the covariance matrix um, is also time invariant. Okay, so that's a, that's a, that's an assumption. And if you, if you allow me to do that, then I can impose, um, I can see what that implies for the, the, uh, the state space representation. The important verbal uh, formalization of, or verbal expression of that is that, that the covariance structure of the, di of the model is independent of calendar time. Okay, so let's just assume A3, which is kind of a standard assumption for us, and then we can compute um, the unconditional mean using the, and I, here I just show this just to remind you that we learned the law of iterated expectations for a reason, right? So the expectation of an expectation is equal to the expectation. These are all unconditional expectations. So the expectation is also a linear operator. So we can pass it through a linear uh, multiple, pre-multiplication of the object of interest. And then, therefore we can uh, apply the fact that the expectation of omega t plus 1 is equal to 0. And there we have the unconditional mean property um, in a covariance uh, stationary process implies that this mu, the expected value of, of x, is um, exactly the unit eigenvalues eigenvector of that process. So this is why it was relevant to learn eigenvalues and eigenvectors before because now it's showing up in a different form. It has nothing to do with the type of Markov chain we had before, but it's, it's a very similar idea. Okay, so we can actually use that fact 
to derive, if we know what A0 A is, we can derive uh, the expected value immediately. So it, it could be zero. We could have a process that has a mean zero, or we could have exactly one uh, vector that satisfies um, this, uh, this property that has non-unit, that has non-zero elements, which would be the unconditional mean of the process. Okay, so that allows us to have constants but the state space has to carry the constant through the process, and we'll do that later. We'll show that. Um, if you have a constant in your process, you have to have a, um, an element of one in the state vector that will allow you to pick off um, and exhibit the, um, this constant that is unconditional uh, throughout time. Okay, so we, if we know what the covariance, if we know what the, uh, the expected value is, then we can compute the unconditional variance covariance matrix just by stripping off the expected value, taking the outer product, taking the expectations. We did this last time quickly, but I wanted to show you again because it involves um, the expectation of a product, of, of, of the outer product of a vector um, that consists of a sum. So you have a, two things banging together and you have four expressions that, are, that come out of that. They're all matrix expressions. You can take the expectation of that, that sum of four different terms and um, two of them disappear. And one, one that's left is basically, uh, by virtue of the property, we can take the expectation of, a, of an outer product of a random vector and it turns out to be the covariance matrix which we assume to be the identity matrix. Okay, so you can see what happens. The expectation, the, the, um, the conditional covariance matrix of xt plus one, xt plus one tra transpose is, a line is, is basically uh, a kind of a quadratic, quadratic form. It, it involves uh, the previous value of this expectation, but we've assumed that, that that is the same by stationarity. Okay, so that's gonna help us uh, calculate uh, that. But just to make sure you understand, even if I write that out in, in, in detail, you get the same answer. Okay, so I'm actually, in the case that, the, uh, that mu is not equal to zero, it still goes through. Here I kind of imposed that it was, I imposed that it was zero. Okay? So stationarity means that that thing doesn't change over time. It's time independent. Therefore, it implies the equation that you see here, which is kind of an unsol unsolvable analytically, um, a pr equation that's unsolvable analytically, but it certainly pins down uh, for the conditions we have, uh, the covariance matrix. And once we get that covariance matrix, we can use it to, to solve arbitrary lags and leads um, as a power of the lag or the lead. Okay, so we need to find that one and uh, I told you about Lyapunov last time, tragic figure, um, and I think he actually did kill himself, but um, he was really smart and managed to um, use these types of equations to look at fluid, fluid mechanics. So his thing was fluid mechanics, but it's useful to us, okay? And it turns out that you can actually use, you can use uh, very simple numerical methods. You can do it yourself if you want, but you can actually call up a program and, um, in Sargent's uh, program data, database or program ba uh, data bank, program bank that uh, will do this for you. Okay. Um, and this, the, this fun fact that the covariance matrix at arbitrary lead or lag J is a deterministic function of the zero lag covariance matrix is an important fact. It's just basically powers of A0J. That's why it's so important. If I tell you what A0J is, and I tell you what the covariance matrix at zero is of the process, then you can calculate the others without even coming back to me. And you can actually just let your computer generate this. In fact, that's a very important function. It's called the autocovariance function. And we will use this in a lot of applications, also in microeconomics. Any, anytime you have a time series, the time series process is not white noise. That means the expectation of successive leads and lags with uh, the contemporaneous value of the, of the random variable of interest is not equal to zero, because white noise would be zero. If you had a, the covariance, auto, auto covariance function of white noise is literally just a, a matrix at the zero, and then everything else is zero. 
right? Because it's not correlated with itself, it leads and lags. But anytime you don't have that, and we think macro matters because high interest rates today kind of imply high interest rates tomorrow for some time, and we know that the interest rates move around a little bit, and we know that GDP does that too, and that's kind of what we're trying to capture. So the auto covariance function is a deterministic function of the model. Look carefully at it. It's a solution to that Lyapunov uh, function. So if I tell you what A0 is, and I tell you what C is, you should be able to calculate Cx. And then with Cx, you can calculate all the other, you know, so this is kind of this idea of I give you a little bit of information, a lot of information that's summarized in this state space representation, you can tell me all the interesting time domain characteristics of the data that the model generates. And that's what macro does. So no matter what, how big your model is that you're looking at, it can be somehow represented like this. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, so just to, for completeness, we may not be able to observe all the elements of X, and if that's the case, and we have to transform the X to get something that we can observe, and then we can define what we could observe and calculate and estimate using the data. So we can go to the data and calculate these autocovariances at arbitrary leagues and lags if we have enough data, and then we can sort of, we can estimate the autocovariance function, possibly with lots of error, Okay, but in this model, we can comp compute it exactly. It's as if we had a million, zillion, jillion observations, because it's a theoretical model. Theoretical model, data, time domain. That's the first kind of link, link up. This is also called the autocovariogram, and I'm gonna show you some examples in, in a minute of, the, of that object. Okay, so you know, if you do that, you can do other things. We know a lot already, I mean, we know how to, what, what the theory um, implies, so we can compute a conditional mean. So I know what GDP and unemployment are today. I know the model. What is my uh, expectation of those two objects tomorrow, given my model? Okay, that's what I've got here. Given the model means conditional on A0 and C. Okay. And you can see that the Markov property buys us a linear combination of the state vector. Right, you smash it on the right, on the left-hand side, with a zero, and you current, and then you get basically the best. That's the best you can do if the model's right. Right, that's the best you can do. So that's kind of interesting. Wow. We can also do the auto covariances because we care about that. If I know that unemployment is high tomorrow, what does that imply for um, inflation tomorrow? What does that imply for anything else that my model talks about? Okay, so I can, it's gonna also be um, related to this transmission matrix that we have, um, we've already specified in the model. Okay, we can also be real brave and take a, take a stand on what we think the model implies for um, J periods ahead values. We call this the J step ahead forecast. Okay, and you can write it out. That's what we're interested in, and we know that Remember, the, the, the cool thing about this uh, state space is it implies that in J periods, everything is kind of summarized by what I have now and the intervening shocks, which I don't know. Right? I don't know them because otherwise they, <laughs> we, wouldn't, we wouldn't be in period T looking at J, T plus J. So um, you can write the implications of the model out and you can take expectations and, and a lot of things disappear. And what you have is basically the fading echo of the initial condition or the current condition. So if J is really, really large, if I'm looking 20 years into the future, the influence of today's action may be rather modest because this is a stationary world, so powers of AJ are getting less and less large over time, right? That's what stationarity means. We can do the same thing for auto covariances as well. Okay, so this A0 matrix is extremely important. It has an incredible weight in our thinking. So being able to specify it correctly is useful. And then you can ask your computer to, to do the, the analytic multiplication and, and powers and inversion. And, and it's essentially, it's what Dynar does. We'll, we'll do that later. Solving models that have forecasts of the future as part of the present is nothing but an implementation of these ideas. 
Okay, so we can even, we can even ask the question, okay, we made a mistake. In, in J periods, we're not going to have the right answer. We're going to have the best possible answer in period T of T plus J. Um, what, what, is the, what does the behavior of that error look like? Okay, so we can compute, we can compute, again, this is using the transition equ equation plus the observation equation. We can actually calculate the forecast error um, and we can calculate its variance. And the variance will be growing. You know, the farther out from the future, the more likely I'm going to miss some pretty big shocks that will mess up my forecast. <laughs> okay, so think of it as a sandwich with the with uh, the pieces of bread or the G, and inside is this increasing pile of ingredients in the sandwich as we move T, as we move J further and further away from, its, from zero. Okay, so this is often used as a, as a metric for model, model performance. Okay, now it's gonna get interesting. So this is, um, and again, if you think about the model, and we're looking at, at stable uh, processes. So this implies that, the, again, using the, la the, the language of eigenvalues, that all the eigenvalues of A0 are less than one in modulus. Okay, so an eigenvalue can be, as we know already, can be complex conjugate. And if that's the case, we have to have a, a, a bigger picture of what small enough means. If we're in the world where eigenvalues are all real valued, then it just has to be less than one. Okay, it's, and it's another way, the, the intuition is that it shrinks all the influences to, uh, in the long run to zero. But if you have complex conjugate eigenvalues, that means that the, the implied dynamics of the model are gonna have waves. So we're gonna hit, we're gonna hit the, the sine and cosine function very quickly now. And the implication is that the, the wave has to get damped down to zero over, over time. That's the, another implication of, of uh, stability, or we, we say uh, con conditional stationarity. The mathematical formulation is that the eigenvalues, these lambda that solve the eigenvalue, the definition of an eigenvalue, all lie inside the unit circle. And the unit circle is the circle defined on the complex conjugate plane. And I will do that in detail in a second. But I just want you to understand that's a classic condition. If you do macro at all, you will always get responses from, even if you don't do it yourself, you're gonna get responses from Dynar or whatever program you're using that says, oop, eigenvalues are greater than zero, the model doesn't work, or maybe too many eigenvalues outside the unit circle. What does that mean? That's what we're gonna to learn today. It's a stability property, okay? For right now, we're looking at unconditional stability, which means that we're gonna have all eigenvalues inside the unit circle. Now, why do I care about that? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use the lag operator again to show how, if you allow me to, to assume xt plus one is equal to a zero times xt plus c omega t plus one, you allow me to do that, then I can write the current value or the, or the future value of xt as a lagged value of all the shocks that have happened since the beginning of time. Or to any arbitrary starting position plus the value that the, the system took at that date. Okay, that's the implication of this state space representation. It's kind of like a, a machine, roll it backward, you can roll it forward. That's the, the logic. Okay, so we can use the lag operator to formalize that. Remember what the lag operator does? It's a backshift operator. So if you give me a time-defined time vector, the lag operator simply just subtracts one from that index. And therefore, the square of the lag operator is two lags, and three, the power of three is three lags. And it's a linear operator, so I can take the lag of a linear combination of x and y indexed by t, and that's gonna give me um, the, the, the linear factors, or the, the, the linear coefficients times the lagged values of x and y respectively, okay? So t minus j is like the jth power of L times xt. And the cool thing about the lag operator is you can treat it like a scalar. You can treat it, you can actually, we did that already in, in class, but you can, it's, it's amazing. And 
this is going to help us understand why the, the so-called moving average representation is implied by my state space uh, setup. So I'm going to take this transition equation and I'm going to use L. So how would you do that? How would you plug in, uh, how would you operationalize what I just did? Just want to see if you're following and not, not doing something else. <laughs> I told my other class this, uh, when, I was a, when I first started teaching at Humboldt University, um, I had this really large macro class, and I had, um, the guys would always read the sports part of the newspaper when they weren't interested in what I was doing, and the women would knit, right? This is the 1990s. Nowadays, it's the other way around. <laughs> the men are knitting, and the women are reading the newspaper. But now, I just have to make sure that you're not reading the newspaper right now, because this is important, right? So who wants to help me? How would I use a lag operator to fix this? Yeah. Good. Okay. So why is that helpful? I'm going to collect terms. And then what do I do then? Okay. Can I do something? Remember, x is a vector. Okay. It, algebraically, I should be able to do something. I could solve for xt plus 1. I'd have to invert this matrix because this, this thing on the left-hand side is a matrix. It's not a, it's L is, it's a matrix in the lag operator. The elements of the, the matrix contain the lag operator in very, at various positions. So it's kind of funky looking, but it can be inverted. Under certain assumptions, it can be inverted. Okay, and if I can do that, you can actually write it out. You can actually take a two by two and play with it, and you see, wow, that's interesting. I get this inverse, and then I could multiply it out, and I'm gonna get, I'm going to get this. And this is actually, when you write it out, it's <laughs> infinitely many lags of omega, going way back till Anno Tobak, the beginning of time. OK, so it's interesting, right? It's really interesting, because it says basically the, the, the omega is containing all the information that I need to know for xt, but I really have to know, or xt plus 1, but I have to know a lot. But over time, these remote lags don't matter so much. And I always tell the story of the building at the Humboldt University, which was built in 1903. That was kind of a shock. We had this huge, big chunk of capital. Uh, it was called the Berliner Handelshochschule. And they built this, and it was the Kaiser, the, the emperor was there, he dedicated this building. And we're still feeling the shock today. We still have that building even though it's not so important. <laughs> it could be, we could be here. We're actually having the lecture in the DIW. Um, that kind of um, way of thinking about it may help you because uh, well, World War II is like a big shock. We're still feeling a little bit of, of, the, of the trace of that, but not as much as we would have in 1960. Okay, so that's the way macroeconomics kind of thinks about this. It doesn't depend on the time uh, period per se calendar date. It depends on the time between the shock and the present. Okay, so that's kind of the way we want to look at this. And this is an infinite, this is an infinite um, moving average. So that's one representation of the data, if you allow me to use the state space representation. Now look carefully at that. We see that A0 is, and, and C basically contain everything. I just have to transform it. And that gives me the, the, um, the current value of the state vector, which is kind of, it's, it's, an, it's an amazing fact. So this is called the Wald representation of the data. It's all named after Hermann Wald, famous uh, statistician. I think he was Swedish. I can't remember exactly. Okay. And, uh, you know, uh, you can, this is true for all t. So as I can run this into the future, I can run into the past. Um, but this restrictions we've made means that this thing doesn't explode. Because if you think about it, usually when you sum up things for a long time, uh, they get really big, but not if it's stationary. Okay, so the, the magic of this whole assumption of stationarity is that, that even if we've had some really lousy shocks and we're accumulating them over millions of years, it's not going to have any effect. Um, infinite periods in the future. It will always damp down in some sense. So the very simple covariant stationary processes that we all know, the AR1 process, for example, or the AR2 process with 
with stationarity attached to it. And you can see that in the univariate case, less obvious in the multivariate case, but this tells you what you need. Okay? The walled representation, the time domain representation is so important to macro. It's kind of our bread and butter. It's what we use and we're gonna, if you go back and think about my very first lecture when I talked about the ASAD model, the baby undergraduate, it has a walled representation, right? In fact, it's unique. If I have a stationary model that doesn't explode, okay, it has, it has a walled representation and it's a unique representation. Okay, yeah. Right. For example, if I think about a climate crisis and I think about inventions like the industrial revolution. Good. Which, for example, the effect increases over time. Very good, right. Are there models for that? Sure, of course. But we need to transform them into a, if we want to use this type of analysis, we need to transform the non-stationary process into a stationary process. How would you do that? It's a great question, but you probably know the answer. How would you, tra I have data on, TFP, level of TFP, I've constructed a TFP series, and it looks like it's exploding. Well, logs won't do enough. Logs just makes it linear. Then you would take first differences or remove some trend that you think is, is deterministic. Okay, so a lot of people of, of your, Skepticism might say, let's take log first differences. Let's take logs and then take first differences. And if you have a, a unit root in the underlying data, the difference operation, the, which is like the linear lag, it's like a lag operator, it's also linear, um, will remove that type of non-stationarity. But if you're wrong, you might over-difference and then you introduce some unlikely and unwanted uh, covariance in the data. So it's really a tricky operation. You have to have, make a good argument. Most good economists will do both and say, look, my results are kind of independent of whether I have a deterministic trend or a, um, uh, a stochastic trend. So that doesn't, that's not a killer argument against this. It just means we have to transform the model into a stationary version for which the, the micro foundations or the model itself still apply, obviously. But you have to do that, otherwise this type of logic will not apply. So absolutely right. Okay, that's key. Okay, so this is the walled representation. And there he is, there's Herman. <laughs> so if you're interested in this guy, you can look it up. Very important contribution, and we still talk about the walled representation as being the, the foundation of what, what, what we do in the time domain. Okay, so you can think of the impulse response following directly from that. It's like an isolated tweak to the system, what happens? And this is when you go forward. So you use the same machinery, not going backward, but we're gonna go forward now, right? Because we know what xt is, the vector of current observables or the current state. If we can observe all the, all the states, we would call it the, the um, it would be the same thing as y. And we can go forward, arbitrary number of, of, uh, of um, periods, but since we can't observe omega, that's just a, th a theoretical representation of the data in, um, in little t periods, hence, or in, in period t. Okay, we can call this the impulse response function because that's what it is. You start in period t, and then I hit this, the system, maybe was in the steady state by assumption, and then we hit it with a, because th we're theori theoreticians in this, in this instant, we're, we're free to do that. And what would a one standard deviation impulse to, to omega do to us? And it does a lot. I mean, the, if the model is, is sensible and it's not trivial, then it's going to have an impact effect and it's going to have feedback effects and possibly multiplier effects that rise over time. And that's all going to depend on the behavior of the model as summarized succinctly in A0 and C. Right? That's the, the genius of this. I mean, again, I tell you what A0 and, and C is. You can compute this object for anything you want. Constructing A0 and C requires a model. It requires a theory. It requires some sort of input from your side. So this object, um, just a, again, powers of, powers of A0 uh, 
pre-multiplying C gives us the unit shock impact uh, as we move through time. And again, you can, you can use uh, MATLAB to compute this anytime, anytime you want. The model can be quite large, and if you have lots of lags, it's gonna, the X factor is gonna be quite big. So you're gonna have to do this right, but it's just a way of convincing you that the Markov property is incredibly useful and important. Okay. And if you can't observe XT, you can use the observation equation just to give you a, a handy dandy uh, transform of that. Okay. So this is, again, we're ultimately the, the rest of, the, of my course will be about trying to think about this A0 matrix because its eigenvalues are crucial. Even if they're all within the unit circle and you have stability in the well-defined sense, you could have cycles. The eigenvalues could be complex conjugate. If they're not complex conjugate, then the shock gets sort of you know, processed by the system in a fairly monotonic way. Almost all, not always monotonically, but it's, it uh, doesn't involve waves. It might involve a little hump and then you converge monotonically, but you don't cross the zero. And when you cross the zero, that's kind of what we think cycles are. So we'd like to have a model that at least admits the possibility of complex conjugate uh, eigenvalues. Okay, so again, I can't, can't <laughs> emphasize it enough, but understanding what A0 is, and again, A0 can be quite large depending on the state vector's dimensions, uh, is crucial for understanding how the model behaves. And we can do this without, without simulating the model. We don't have to. That's the cool thing. We really have enough information, and that's, gonna, that's the segue to what I'm about to talk about. Okay. In this section, we will consider some simple examples really baby examples, right? But the box is very large. You can accommodate all sorts of cool models. So think of an AR1 process that would be, you know, an XT could be a vector, it could be univariate. Um, if, it's a, if it's univariate, an AR1 process is really easy to understand. So you can write that down in the state space, you can write a moving average in the state space, those are in the book. Um, I will probably repeat them in the section. You can do an armor process, and it's all a matter of getting the, the XT right. So the first thing in a, in a stress situation, like an exam, you want to write down the XT vector first and say, is this right? Can I put all the stuff on the, in the A0 that's necessary to pre-multiply to get XT plus one, right? It's a little bit like Sherlock Holmes. It's like an escape room. <laughs> you just have to figure it out, okay? VAR. Large dimensional vectors, it sounds awful, but it's actually very, very trivial. It's in the book. And we just have to fit it into this box, okay? So, um, you know, this, this gives us all sorts of representations of objects that might be of interest. So for example, the, the covariogram that we just described before also has kind of a representation in the in the walled world, okay? Remember we've defined it before, uh, it was a power of AJ, but it's also kind of, you can write it like this. So this is the covariance matrix, uh, and as you can see, it's got a, it's a sandwich. It's a sandwich of these inverted polynomials in the lag operator, polynomial matrices in the lag operator, as a sandwich with C hitting the, the only random stuff, which is this ker kernel of, of randomness, and the expectation of the outer product just shows you, we've condensed, uh, again, this is for any arbitrary model you want to write down, including the, the, the baby ASAD we looked at in the very first class. Look at that, that's, that's, a, that's an object that will be familiar to us later. That's a representation of the autocovariogram, okay, in the time domain. Okay, so that's a really important expression. It looks, um, looks monstrous, uh, but, <laughs> but it's, it's just a very efficient way of expressing it, okay? If you like matrix algebra, well, you're probably miles ahead of me, but <laughs> um, if you don't like matrix algebra, watch Gilbert Strang's lecture. I put it on online. It's on Moodle. It's so great. He's such a delightful, I think he's still alive. He's like the, he's the most awesome teacher of all time of linear algebra, MIT. 
So he, he, he gives this lecture to engineers, and he does it all without any notes, and just like writing. You know, so, and he, he really gives you the idea of what uh, eigenvectors do for you and what eigenvalues do for you, and he's just a brilliant teacher. Um, if you have a chance, if you like, if you like to be entertained, that's a great, it's a great movie. I have another movie that I, I'm going to post today, which may not be so, <laughs> so ha make you so happy, but it's very interesting, and it involves the station. The the, uh, the next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about the the frequency domain. Okay, so again, just to remind you, stationarity buys us a lot, but it also means a lot. So we really need to be sure that the model that we're thinking about has this property. And if it does, it's gonna buy me into a lot of, lot of things, and it's all about the modulus of the eigenvalues. So if I give you A0, it's gonna be a matrix, and you can do the eigenvalue operations either with a computer or by hand, and you wanna look at those, inspect them, and see what they look like. And if you have one that's on the unit circle, that's okay, that would correspond to the unique expected value unconditional expected value of the process in general. That would be the unconditional means. But if you have two or one that's outside, then you have to, you're going to have to worry about unconditional stability because you won't have it. Okay, so that reference means that effectively I can always write the state vector in a partition form where the unit, um, the... Uh, the first, first position is occupied by one, and that will give me basically the ability to have uh, the unconditional values of this uh, process without, um, that are not equal to zero. Okay, so it's just another way of representing. And therefore, the A tilde would be the, the lower right-hand partition of this um, of this A0 matrix that would have strictly less than one eigenvalues in modulus. And I keep using the word in modulus. Right now, just think of it as absolute value, because if it's real value, it just has to be less than one in absolute value. So if it's a negative number, it has to be still uh, less than one in when you take a minus sign in front of it. But more complicated would be this, this notion of of complex conjugate, and I'm gonna to have to, to spend some time thinking about that. So the next few minutes, we're gonna talk about the implication of having complex conjugate uh, eigenvalues in the A0 matrix for the behavior of the system. It's gonna imply that you have waves in response to a one-off one shock. Waves oscillating around zero. So you'll spend some time above and some time below, some time above, and the frequency of those trans transitions will also be driven by uh, the same eigenvalue um, pair, okay? So this goes back to some, and I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna try to motivate this because a lot of people don't, don't get motivated. I mean, it's, maybe I'm not very good at motivating, but it, it is worth getting motivated about, <laughs> okay? So the walled representation can be thought of as a, as a unique way of thinking about any covariant stationary time series process in terms of a unique linear combination of shocks. We call that the time domain. And I told you that if it's co covariant stationary and you simulate it a million times and you look at those, those things, uh, on average they're gonna have behavior uh, that's kind of independent of any individual realization, but it's gonna look like they have waves. So you're gonna say, okay, uh, I've got 50 years of this series I've done it a million times, I noticed that a lot of the waves seem to look like they happen every five years. And maybe every, every, uh, every if you have quarterly data, every four quarters, there's a, there's a, something happens at Christmas time or the, the winter uh, or the summer, okay? We, we would call that um, a cyclical or harmonic function of time. Okay, so think of, Oh, think of taking my data and representing it not in the time domain, but representing it as a function of frequencies. That's called the frequency domain representation. If you know anything about econometrics, it's a trivial idea to think about, I have 100 observations of data. I could regress them using regression on 100 different sine and cosine waves call that my data. 
And because I have 100 different waves, I could, I could literally explain everything. R squared equals 1. The weights on those different waves are like the intensity of the different frequencies as represented by this finite set of data. So that's an intuitive way of thinking of what the Fourier representation, the, time, the, the frequency domain representation does. And the weights of, those, of that theoretical regression um, is the contribution to total variance in some sense. Right? So if you get a large number, then that means that, well, that's a really important wave. That wave explains a lot of the variance, total variance. Now remember, we're going to be talking about infinite amounts of data. So if it, the, the problem with, with doing frequency domain analysis with real, real data is you need really lots of data because you're estimating lots of parameters and otherwise you're going to have to do some sort of smoothing technique to, to get a rough idea. And the movie I'm posting will actually explain that in very, very, very clear detail without any math. It just shows a lot of pictures. And it shows how the movies you watch on YouTube are basically fast Fourier transforms of, of Cartesian data that's reverse transformed so we can watch it and transform it in such a way that it's easy to, to send through the internet because otherwise it's just too much. Okay, so that's really cool. It has nothing to do with macro, but it'll help you understand what we're doing here, okay? This is kind of what Kondratiev was talking about. Kondratiev had this idea that, that, um, that cycles were kind of uh, all sorts of cycles. So the longest wave, right, with one completion of the cycle over the entire observation period could be relevant. So you were talking about technological innovation. Sometimes that is what we observe. We, over the past 200 years, we've observed the technological innovation of using petroleum uh, to do stuff, and now we're going to stop doing it. <laughs> so eventually we're going to come down again, right? So that, that kind of shock is very, very low frequency, whereas a, a great Christmas this year because of the pandemic will certainly affect Germany in the next few years, but not as much. Okay, so all these different waves are... Ha the, comp the, the decomposition is, is perfect. You give me an infinite number of data points, I can give you an infinite number of frequencies that can catch that stuff, as long as the data are stationary. So that's the intuition I'm going to try to give you. And the weights will be related to the A0. The same A0 I showed you before is relevant for the frequency domain representation. So if you go to Sargent and Lundqvist and Sargent and look at that carefully, now you're, the, the, the Schuppen werden von, 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 von den Augen fallen, you know, the scales will fall from your eyes, as they, they say in the Bible. <laughs> and, and you'll understand why Kondratiev actually was kind of an interesting fellow. Another sad story, because he landed in the gulag and he kind of disappeared. No one knows what, I think no one knows what happened to Kondratiev. Um, but in any case, he produ produced some very interesting research at the low frequency. So he really thought that, he, he understood that some of these innovations have real long-term impact. And the only way you can estimate that or see that in the data is you have to have lots of data, lots of time. Not just, you know, finance data is so proud of having second by second data, millisecond by millisecond. It doesn't matter. You need decades and centuries of data. You need the time domain to be really, really large. So that's why economic history is so interesting to us. Anyway, click on the link, you'll find out why it's so sad. So now I'm going to move from the time domain representation to the frequency domain representation. To repeat, this is the frequency. This is not the frequency. This is the time domain representation, the so-called walled representation. And you can see it as it's an infinite moving average looking backwards of the process. So if you write it like that, you can see that it's a, it's a sequence. It's a sequence of powers of A0. You could, you could write, you could just, we don't, we don't know in any period what omega is. If we did know it, we could generate the x, but really the essential information is in AJ and, uh, and C. And in fact, it's a sequence of matrices defined by powers of A0, okay? The frequency domain takes that information and slams it with something else, something called Euler's number. It's a, actually the power of, it's a, it's a complex conjugate expression that involves the, 
different frequencies that we're looking at, and then it looks at that thing. It's called a Fourier transform. So I'm going to take that thing, I'm going to take this thing, and I'm going to slam it with powers of Euler's number. Euler's number is 2.71 something, right? It's the base of the natural logarithm. And that has a really ma has magical properties. Again, magical properties that are incredibly interesting. So I'm going to define this Fourier transform of the covariogram, which again, we already said was just the power of A0 to the J times C. And I'm going to hit it with this thing. It's Euler's number raised to the imaginary number I, the square root of minus 1, indexing it with a minus number for reasons you'll see later. And T is the index that goes from minus infinity to infinity. And that's what's called a Fourier transform. It's just a, it's a multiplying something by powers of something, um, whatever you want. And in this particular, the, the case of a Fourier transform, it, we're going to be using this, this um, Euler's number raised to this frequency. This is the, called the frequency. So we, this is the magic number, theta. And that's why this expression is a deterministic function. There's no randomness in this at all. It's a deterministic function of theta. And it's a matrix. Why is it a matrix? It has the same dimensions that x has. Remember, x is the, the object of interest. x is the, the thing that we were, we were tracking in the time domain. Now I'm going to try to represent it in the frequency domain. Remember, all I need to know is the history of the shock. Um, then I get a particular value of x, but if, if I don't know the history of the shock, I know how the system will transform any shock process, and that's basically um, powers of A0 to the J times C. And that's what Cx of tau is at different values of tau. Tau would be my J in the previous expression. Okay, so that thing looks ugly, and you, you'll be amazed to see how it's not so ugly if you know some trigonometry. That's why I posted Sargent's one-page appendix on the website. Please download that and take it to bed and look at it for a couple of hours, <laughs> a couple of minutes before you go to sleep. It'll put you to sleep, but it's stuff that you will remember. It involves angles and the definition of cosine and sine, really baby stuff. I, mean, I learned it when I was in high school. I was kind of lucky I had a good, a good teacher. Um, but there's some other stuff that you may not understand, but then when you look at it long enough, you'll understand it. And I'm going to tell you why in a second. I'm going to tell you all this stuff right now. This is the definition. This thing is called the spectrum, the spectral density matrix. It's a way of thinking about a process that we've described in the time domain in the frequency domain. And it's all a function of this. It's a function of theta. Theta can be very low or it can be very high. It's going to come from the interval 0 to pi. Even though I put it here minus pi to pi, it's a symmetric function. So I can chuck any frequencies from 0 to minus pi. It's a symmetric. So all I need to do is take the other, other end, evaluate it, and maybe multiply it by 2. Two just raises the spectrum. We don't care about that. We care about the relative concentration of variance at different, um, different frequencies. And that's what the spectrum does for us. I'll tell you in a second. And if you want to know more about this, if you like this stuff, Fourier transforms, this is the book I learned it from. Okay, It's just for macroeconomists. It's not mathematics. But Sargent <laughs> relatively smart guy, Nobel Prize. You know, he sort of, he, he anticipated a lot of the issues that we would care about, and I put the appendix to his book online. It's just a one-pager. Take a look at it. Maybe it's two pages. It's <laughs> one page is words, and the other is, it's like a set of facts. Okay, so I'm going to replicate, I'm going to repeat those facts for you right now. So the complex conjugate number that we pre-multiplied the, covari the covariogram with, the Fourier transform of the covariogram, involve the square root of 1. 
complex conjugate numbers. In our world, they always come in pairs. Don't worry. Worry if you have a single complex conjugate number. But in the case of all the analyses we'll do, they'll always come in pairs, right? And that's very reassuring. This is not a mathematics course. It's really not. Okay, so now how do you represent, how do you represent this thing? It's a linear combination of a real part and an imaginary number. And the linearity is A and B. So A and B are like a pair of numbers that completely describe that complex conjugate number. Therefore, we can use the Cartesian plane, real, complex, and plot those numbers in that plane. And they can be anywhere, not just in the positive orthant. They can be in the negative orthant. They can be in the other orthants. It doesn't matter. Now you understand where the circle comes from. The circle is the circle in that plane, and that's the critical value that we want for stationarity. So the, the, the eigenvalues that we look and find, look for and find, will have to be inside that circle. I'll plot that for you in a second. So if you, if you, but just think of that Cartesian plane. It's wonderful, right? So Descartes gives us the Cartesian representation of complex conjugate numbers. And that's useful, but it's not exhaustive. Because um, when we solve for these eigenvalues, you, you've seen it already. You, know, you, can get, you can get, when you take the quadratic formula, that's the easy one. You can always get um, something that looks like a plus or minus bi. Okay? Um, and it's kind of hard to think how that would relate to macro. But it does, because there are other ways to represent a complex conjugate number equivalently that map into the cyclical properties that I'm trying to look at. So remember th theta. Theta is the frequency, as I've defined it, but it also corresponds to an object in the Cartesian diagram. It, it corresponds to the angle formed by the ray defined by the coordinates with the x-axis. Okay, so we need, to, we need to refresh your memory here. And if you don't like what I just did, if you want to do it again, take a look at the, the website uh, that we have here, or any good, any good website that kind of goes through the details. But I'm going to try to, I'm going to do my best. I've been doing this for many years now, so it's like my effort to try to, try to give you the fun facts of the frequency domain. So here's the thing. We've done Cartesian. A and B are real. That's the easy. There's another way to express it. The same information you can express as an angle and a distance, a distance from 0 to the point in the Cartesian coordinate system. You just have to know what the angle is. And the angle is related to that point using the sine and cosine functions. Okay, so that's something you'll have to remind yourself is. Remember the sine and the, the cosine are basically functions of an angle, and if you represent it in the two-dimensional plane, it's going to be something like the, the sine would be the, the rise divided by the hypotenuse of the triangle, and the cosine would be the, the run, the horizontal displacement divided by the hypotenuse of the triangle. That's the definition of sine and cosine, and it's also just, an, and this is what Euler figured out, and other people, that's why it's called the, the polar form. It's the polar representation, and here is our theta. It's the angle, right? So I'm gonna, you'll see the picture in a second. Um, it's gonna give us everything we need. That's the second representation. The third one, is just another implication of the same information. This is what Euler discovered, okay? Not just that it's a convenient base for logarithms, but also that it maps into this cosine sine business. It's the power, and again, r is the distance from the origin to the point of interest. The same r shows up here times a power of his number of his uh, Napierian base, his E. And again, we have a complex conjugate pair, and that's why you have plus or minus. That gives us basically the, the, the symmetric representation around the, 
the x-axis, and the thing is, is replicated as a power of plus or minus i times theta. I'm going to show you that, but I just want you to kind of let it sink in. There are three ways that are equivalent mathematically. So if you, if you, want to, if you buy into the idea of a complex number, you have to buy into the other ones. I mean, we all buy this one. I bought this when I was in high school. It took me a, a, a couple of years of college to, to, to learn those. <laughs> Actually, I learned, I learned the, the, the polar form, polar coordinates when I was in high school, too. But I didn't do o Euler or Euler until um, the American expression, uh, the American pronunciation is, is Euler. But I, I like Euler, even though he was actually Swiss. I think he was, so who cares? OK, so how do I show that? Well, in the Cartesian representation, remember we're talking about, we're talking about something like just a number like this. Here's A, B, and there's A, and there's B. Well, lo and behold, there's a distance between this point and this one, and that distance is the square root of A squared plus B squared. And that's a real number. That's the distance. So we call that r. OK? So that's the link I'm going to generate between the Cartesian representation and the polar and Euler representations. OK? That's the distance. Right? That's r. So basically, I don't have enough information just to know this distance. I, I need to know this angle. And the angle can be defined using the, so the cosine or the sine function. Right? So the, let's see if we can get this right. So A is equal to cosine theta times R. And B is equal to sine theta times R. OK, so you can manipulate it. Doesn't matter. It's a one-to-one -one transformation of those A and B coordinates. I got it right. <laughs> we call A, um, A and B are the the Cart Cartesian numbers, and this is the angular frequency. It's the frequency of interest. It's what we really care about. And you can see that if I tell you what r and theta are, you can tell me what a and b are, and vice versa. There's a unique representation. So that's why it's so cool, because Cartesian and polar are just another way of it's just different language describing the same thing. I'd like to make this evaporate now. Excuse me for a second. Now it's a little bit of harder sell to tell you why this is the same in the Euler representation, okay? But it's really cool because it involves um, an expansion of this expression. Okay, it's a, it's a power expansion around um, around zero, okay? And it turns out that you can, when you look at that very carefully, you see that a lot of terms actually cancel. And what's left over is exactly this. Okay, this is, this is called de Moivre's theorem. So I, I'm, um, I'm not gonna prove it to you, but you can show that if you take an expansion um, of this Euler's expression, I mean, this is, this is a representation of Euler's number, actually. That's, uh, what Euler showed, basically, um, that it looks like that. Okay, so that's useful. And you can see that basically, if I if I know if I know theta and r, I also know this representation. Okay, because when you multiply that, you end up getting this fun this kind of combination of cosine and sine, and the sine component of theta pre, is, is, is pre-multiplied by the imaginary, uh, imaginary number, okay? All the operations you can do with that last representation uh, give you 
really interesting information. For example, raising that number to a power tau is what? It's, it's e to the plus i to the i tau theta, right? Because the, you raise Euler's number to some power, um, it's like raising, if, if, it's, it's, it's just a, it's a property of exponents, basically, right? Take this to, to the tau power, and it's, um, and then you can move from that back to the polar form or to the Cartesian form. And in a sense, you're moving in, in, in circles as, t, as, as theta um, changes, you're moving through the circle of representations. So this is going to be useful for us because it's going to enable us to simplify that horrible looking expression I had, the definition of the, the spectrum. Think of the modulus is the length of the Euclidean distance in this two by two by uh, two dimensional complex plane that we had before. And that's the same thing I'm going to care about in terms of the eigenvalue. So I want those, if those, if those eigenvalues are, are complex conjugate, then I want them to be inside the unit circle in the complex plane, um, which simply means evaluating that number. Okay, so you can see this is also true for the other representations of, the, of a complex conjugate number. So we've done this one already, but you can also do this. Um, you can take what's called the norm or the or the modulus of that complex conjugate number. And this is something you'll have to, to, to think about in a second. Uh, how do we evaluate that? How do you evaluate the norm of a complex conjugate number? It's the same thing as asking the distance. Okay, what well, turns out to be this plus this times the, um, the minus sign attached to it Okay, and then if you multiply those things out, you end up getting uh, the square root of the cosine squared plus sine squared, and that's just equal to one. So it's gonna be the square root of r squared, which is gonna be equal to r. Okay, so that's, the, that's a useful point. It's also true if you have a minus sign here, it's gonna have the same value, because it's a, it's a reflection around the x-axis. Okay, and similarly, it's true that these two guys are equal for the same reason, and it's just equal to r. So th this is the kind of the, modul the modulus property for complex conjugate uh, values or numbers, and I'll go into detail uh, next week in the section. I'll just show you some examples of how that works, but it's useful to understand that, how that, that operation occurs, okay? So now go back to our, why am I doing this? Well, I wanna evaluate the spectral density matrix. We saw that it was a function of a complex number. That's kind of nasty. I don't know what that is but I do know how to make it into a real, how to transform it into a real representation. Okay, it has a real valued representation, which is what we are interested in. We wanna, we wanna look at the spectrum on paper, and if, <laughs> if, it's, if it's a complex conjugate object, it's not gonna help us much, but it turns out there's a unique, real valued representation of the spectrum. And to do that, I just have to plug in the expression. I just have to plug in, uh, Remember, this, this was an, a forward and backward looking uh, transform, the Fourier transform of this object. But now I've got the, the leads and the lags. I can sort of pair them together at different leads and lags. Okay, and this thing has, a, has magical properties. Okay, we already know this can be represented as uh, cosine uh, theta t and this is minus i sine theta t, or my, cosine theta t plus, uh, minus i sine theta t, and this is cosine theta t plus i sine theta t. And you can see that something's gonna cancel. In fact, all the stuff involving i is gonna cancel. But just, just let that sink in. This is called the, the polar representation of the uh, spectral, uh, so the, the Fourier transform, and this is the, you can substitute, because we already told you there's a dual representation of the, um, of the Euler form in the trigonometric form or the, the polar form. And if you plug that in, you can see that plus i sine theta and t and 
minus I sine theta t are going to cancel at every value of t of tau. Okay, and what's left over is just a cosine function, a sum of cosine functions multiplied by the autocovariogram of this process that I, we started with. Remember, the autocovariogram is a function of A0 and C. Okay, so we've taken that information and we've kind of, we've netted it and, 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 and mashed it and, and, and squished it and, and transformed it and now we have this other thing which is purely a function of theta. Okay, so this is called the spectral density matrix. This is the real valued representation. You can also get the same answer and this is in Lundqvist and Sargent, by taking the transfer function and taking a, tra a Fourier transform of that. This is, this is the so-called transfer function because what it does, it, it transfers the shock into the observable or the state vector that we, we care about. So there are two equivalent ways of calculating this thing. You can use the, the Fourier transform of the covariogram or you can take the Fourier transform of the transfer function. Those turn out to be equivalent. In that case, the spectral density matrix would be the norm or the modulus of this matrix squared. The squared is like, it's like when you take the square root of A squared plus B squared, take the square root of that and then take that squared, the square root sign disappears. It's the same concept taken for a matrix, okay? And what is this thing? This is the, the spectrum of white noise or the, the underlying fundamental process, which we know is serially uncorrelated and has a unit covariance matrix. So it's kind of boring, it's vanilla. It's, it's not very fascinating. It's just a shift. It's a shift of the spectrum. If it's really noisy, you're gonna have a lot of variance to explain. If it's not noisy, not much, but what we care about with the spectrum is the relative, as you move theta from zero to pi, how much of the variance can I explain? And that's the same expression put in a slightly different way, um, but it's also in Lundqvist and Sar uh, Sargent in their book. Okay, so depending on whether you take the fourth edition or the, the third edition, uh, that's the formula of interest. Now these are very, remember A0 could be a very large matrix. So it, evaluating this is kind of painful. And normally you'd ask the computer to do it for you. But as I said already, the real valued representation of this uh, doesn't involve the, the complex numbers at all. It just involves uh, the cosine function, a shifted cosine function effectively. Okay, so let's, let's try to breathe take a couple of deep breaths and just ask what, we, what would have we done so far. We've actually said, I give you a time representation, I can deliver using this, this mathematical property, a frequency domain representation. Okay, so every, every stationary, covariant stationary time series process has a, a frequency domain representation. It has a spectrum that's unique and we can talk about it, we can look at it, we can calculate it. It's also possible to go back to the other, go in the reverse direction, which is a real fun fact. Okay, <laughs> so I tell you what the spectrum is, and you should be able to give me a a um, a walled representation that's unique. Now, how you get that walled representation is not necessarily unique. Many models can give the same walled representation, but I can tell you at least what the moving average representation of, of white noise has to be to give me that kind of spectral density shape. I think Granger wrote a very important paper in the 1960s uh, where he talked about the typical spectral shape. So this is a time series guy like Lutkepol thinking hard about data and said, you know, I've calculated this uh, with my limited data. I've tried to estimate the empirical spectrum that all the inflation rates across the world look similar, a typical spectral shape. That was kind of a deep thought. So the idea that business cycles are kind of similar, even if you're comparing the UK with, with Japan, there seems to be some underlying similarity. It's kind of like saying maybe there's hope in macro of discovering the true model. And in the paper I put on the, on the, on the website, talking about Watson, talking about we've been playing too much with models. 
and not looking at the spectral implications of the models. And the spectrum could give us another dimension by which we could throw away some lousy models because they don't give us the typical spectral shape. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tall order for macroeconomics to do that. Right? And a lot of people don't do that. People haven't jumped on the Watson wagon yet because it's, it's a challenge. You know, and I, I, I have a, one paper in, in the reading, which is, uh, has been published in the American Economic Review by Baudry, they actually, and, and his co-authors, they actually do that. They look at the unemployment, uh, the, the employment data, the spectrum of the employment data in the United States. It's very interesting. You can see how uh, this is a challenge. Okay, so in other words, it's possible to go back and forth. You, you give me this, I can evaluate this across the potential spectra, you know, normalize suitably because this is a constant, and I can give you the covariance matrix that's theoretically implied by the spectrum. If you give me the covariance matrix, I can compute the spectrum. We've already done it. Okay, it's called the Riesz representation theorem. So it's possible to go back and forth. I find this. This is from an old time series book that I uh, discovered when I was a graduate student. Actually, when I just got out of out of graduate school. It's in German. But this picture. Okay, and I'll translate it in a second. Um, it says we start with the time series that we can observe. In our minds, we have a model that generates a stochastic process. They both imply autocovariances, correlation with successive leads and lags. One we can actually estimate, and this is called the periodogram, in German, periodogram, <laughs> or the empirical autocovariance function. And in, in German, this is called the Spektraldichte, spectral density, okay? And it can be multidimensional. This, this is written, for, I think, for univariate perspective, but it's the same. That's why it's a matrix, because you can have the amount of covariance between two variables explained at different frequencies. Remember, this, auto, this, this spectral density function is only a function of theta, the angle or the, the frequency, the frequency, okay? And then you can estimate in the frequency domain, it's very difficult, but you can do that. You can also estimate in the time domain, that's what most of us do uh, for reasons of limited data. So here's the English equivalent, right? And I try to put the, uh, the analogs that come from Lundquist and Sargent here. Okay. The problem is we don't have enough data to do a number on the spectral density ma matrix. Um, we have to smooth and do sort of, uh, we have to sort of realize that, I mean, again, think of, think of, the, think of the exercise I talk, talked about at the beginning, taking uh, 100 p observations of inflation, regressing it on different frequencies, um, and then taking those coefficients. If you watch the movie that I'm posting, it'll, they actually do that. They show you that has to have certain OLS properties, et cetera. And literally, you can explain all the variants, but the coefficients are going to be jumping around. There, there's no reason that there'll be a smooth function like the spectral density. So to do that, we have to smooth it or get lots of data. We have to wait a 1,000 years of macroeconomic uh, observation, like Kepler, uh, before we get enough data to do this. So that's not going that's not, that's not to help us very much. right? So, you know, we have a, there's a limitation to what we're doing. Okay, so, again, this is some verbal elaboration. The diagonal elements are your own spectral density. So, you're, again, xt, xt prime. The on-diagonal elements of the S matrix are the own spectral density at different frequencies. And all the off-diagonal elements, which are defined, can be thought of as the covariance between two respective elements of the, of the uh, state vector. Some of those may be uninteresting. Most of them could be interesting. There's a shortcut. So this is, if I asked you to do this on the exam and I had a univariate process, there's a really easy way to, to cut through the the density of this problem, <laughs> okay? It's a cheat. It's not really a cheat. It's the way that uh, I learned it and the way uh, many textbooks kind of motivate it. Lundqvist Sargent is, the, is like the big, is the big uh, Mercedes-Benz and 
Um, I'm talking about the Austin Mini sort of variation. Okay, it gets you where you want to go. Um, and the spectrum of white noise in, in the univariate case is just a constant. It's a constant. So if I gave you, if I gave you white noise and you computed the spectrum, you'd get a flat line because there's no concentration of frequency in that white noise. Successive leads and lags have no correlation, contain no information about future and, and uh, lag values. Okay, so that's, the, that's kind of an interesting fact. So again, the spectrum is really about relative relatives. The absolute uh, noisiness of a, of a series or a vector of series is just a shift. Um, and remember, the interpretation of a spectrum is so fascinating, it's like, um, if, I, if you tell me two frequencies, and I can, I can integrate the spectrum between one point and the other, and that gives me the area under the curve, and that's giving me the information I want. The variance that's explained by frequencies between theta one and theta two. At the point, there's no, I mean, it's, it's a zero measure thing. So it's a function. You need to have an interval, right? a spread between two, two frequencies. This is in, in Lundqvist and Sargent. So I've stolen this from them just to, just to make you understand that there's a time domain. This is the time domain um, representation of a single, a single simulation of, of a process. And the process involved is a univariate order one. So it's yt equals yt minus one times 0.9 plus white noise. This is the example of a hundred periods of simulating one realization. It's just one realization. I could, because it's theoretical, I could do it many times. I could do it a hundred times, a thousand times. I would get a, a thousand realizations of this process. And they all have similar properties embodied in their autocovariance function or their spectrum. Okay, so all the rest is are these objects. This is the covariogram. It looks like a tent. It's symmetric because it's basically the expected value of yt and yt plus j or yt minus j. So it's, it's going to be symmetric, right? You understand that. We understood that last week. What we've learned today, well, you can shock it once and see what happens. Look what happens. Positive shock to this process leads to a, an impact effect that is the greatest, and after that it, it decays exponentially. It's kind of boring, but that's the property of an AR1 process. AR2 processes are a little more interesting. Now the, lat, the whole discussion today is about this representation. The same process represented in the frequency domain. We've got theta here going from 0 to pi, 3.14. One, five, something. I don't know. And this is the density of variance that can be explained at, variance, at various frequencies. Now, what does that mean? Well, look at this. This is one realization. You see there obviously is a cycle here, right? And, and you could say, well, it's not exactly a sine wave, but I can, I can see something. I could count the number of cycles. That's easy. And I could compute the average number of cycles. But I could also say there's some cycles that look rather high frequency and there's some that are very slow. But on average, a lot of variance looks like it's explained by the frequency that would correspond to say maybe three turns uh, in the entire 100, 100 periods. I think a period could be a, a quarter in this example. It makes a lot of sense. So you'd expect a concentration, but it turns out that the concentration is at the lowest frequencies, the very longest waves. And as you get to the high frequencies, there's not much left. Remember, high frequency would be like this. And that's because the series has persistence. Obviously, it has persistence. If I have a, a mega shock in, in period T, then 0.9 is still around in period T plus 1. So it's obvious that the covariogram is going to look like this. A tent with very steep, um, uh, not, not very steep uh, decline and symmetric. And you can imagine that the spectrum, sorry, the impulse response would also have a very slow um, sort of uh, damping. Okay, so you can calculate all those objects. And you can use the handy dandy formula I'm gonna give you later, 
on how to compute that spectrum. So this, this spectrum is actually very easy. It looks, it's just an, it's a function of theta. It's a monotonic, monotone function of theta. Okay, it's not always the case, but useful information. Here's a more complex com process. This is also in Lundqvist and Sargent. This is the AR2. Now the AR2 is something macro people love because it can deliver complex conjugate roots, so we can have the, the wave adjustment. We don't have to have it. Okay, it depends on the values of this, this coefficient, which is 1.3, and the second one, the second uh, coefficient, the, the one on the leg. Call the first one alpha 1 and the second one alpha 2. Okay, so this would be the, this would be the representation, if you like, and if you invert this, you can see that it's gonna be an infinite moving average. Okay, that's an AR2 process. Now look carefully at this. The spectrum is no longer monotone. It's actually got a spectral peak. So that means at this frequency, okay, so this is a, think of this as, the, as, as a measure of cycles per second, uh, per year, per quarter, depending on what the, the, the base observation process is. And we can see quite a bit of variance being explained by these frequencies. High frequencies still not so much. At the very low frequencies, not as much. And you can, if you're interested in this, you can actually write down a little program that will allow you to change the values of alpha one and alpha two and you can get all sorts of interesting shapes. Okay? Still, we can think of a simple one-time sample of the, of the process. We can let this thing run for 100 periods, shocking it every period and it won't ever look like the next one I do because they're all literally random transformations of the data, but they have these similar properties. You can see there are different cycles here compared to the last picture, very different, okay? Look at the covariogram. Look at the correlation of today's value with lagged values or leaded values. It's not monotonic. I mean, high correlation in the near periods and then after a while it gets negative. So this is what the business cycle sounds like to me. I mean, good times are followed by bad times, et cetera. I mean, it's always like that. And this distance is kind of a measure of what we think the average cycle is. That gets transformed into the spectrum and will show up as the determinants of the spectral peak. Pretty cool. This lower right is a sample realization. And if I let this thing run for like 100 jillion years, I would get increasingly precise estimates using the type of method I talked about. If you talk, took that as data, I could actually estimate this directly. This is constructed using the theoretical expression. So again, I'm kind of constrained by the, by the amount of time in my, in my world, as it were. Okay, so I'm done now. Um, when we come back, I will write down some representations of linear models in the state space form, and we'll do a few eigenvalue problems from problem set one, which is posted and will be terminé, will be finished. And then next week, we'll, in the section, we'll, we'll do the spectral stuff, okay? So I'll see you in about an, half an hour.